Listen. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto me any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our scripture this morning is Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to the end of the chapter, verse 28. And our subject is savoring the things of God. Savoring is an archaic word used here in the King James text. Uh, savoring means uh, thinking or contemplating. So it's savoring the things of God or thinking in terms of the things of God. So Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profiteth if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This passage contains one of the uh, difficult sayings of Jesus. It's not difficult to understand, it's just difficult to read it. 
even when we understand Peter's error, the severity of our Lord's rebuke still jumps out at us. Remember, Peter had just previously made the great confession of the church. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus in verse 17 had said, Simon, you're in a state of blessing because that realization only came to you as a gift from God. And then Jesus had added, <clears throat> because you know who I am, you're now to be called the rock like I promised you would when I first met you. Back in John 1, as we recall, he said, you will be called Cephas. Cephas is an Aramaic word for rock. Here we have the Greek word for rock. But, but his name was Simon. Jesus says, you're going to be called a rock. And here he said, because of that confession, you will be, you are now, in fact, Peter or Cephas, the rock. Luke's account applies that this exchange took place right after that. In any case, it couldn't have been more than a, a few days after that. If that's the case, the words to Peter are in stark contrast to the Lord's blessing after his confession. In verse 23, Peter, uh, we're told that Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Mark 8, 33, says Jesus turned about and looked on his disciples before rebuking Peter and saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Which, from which we might infer that perhaps Jesus physically turned away from Peter and looked right at the other disciples and spoke these words. Peter would have had to have been taken aback. And... We still feel the sting of those words. So let's look at what Jesus said in, in order to understand Peter's error. The, first of all, the, the disciples did understand some things. The people we've just seen believed that Jesus was a miracle worker. They were, that was granted. They believed he was, had a, some sort of divine blessing or mission, for sure. But they thought, well, he's a continuation of the ministry of John. Or he's a continuation of the ministry of Elijah or some other prophet. But the disciples had just confessed that Jesus was God and that he was the Christ, the Messiah. The Messiah means the chosen one. It refers to the messianic role. What they didn't know was how the kingdom that Jesus talked about was going to be manifested. They didn't know the way in which Jesus was going to be the Messiah. From a number of incidents in the New Testament right up to the end, it's obvious that the disciples assumed that they were, the kingdom that Jesus talked about would in some way be uh, comparable to that of old Israel. In other words, it would somehow be, uh, have an earthly organization. It would be political in some way. When you believe you're headed for a political kingdom, you expect political victories, if you will, political milestones. You expect to gain ground so that you, in effect, have this earthly presence. So Peter believed in the lordship of Jesus. He believed in the kingdom of heaven. And Peter wanted to see them manifested. And so Peter said, in order for that to happen, we need to see victories, not defeats. Well... When Jesus spoke about dying, Peter objected. Peter probably had the best of intentions. Verse 22 implies he took Jesus aside and spoke to him, perhaps privately. And that, that's when Jesus then rebuked him for all to hear. So in order to understand this a little better, let's go back to verse 21. Verse 21. 
because that really gives us an insight into a new phase in Christ's ministry. Remember we had said that Jesus had issues. He was called demonic by the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, many of his followers had stopped following him when he compared himself to manna, at bread, uh, bread from heaven, the bread of life. And Jesus has been avoiding Galilee. Now in verse 21, we're told that Jesus then began to show the disciples how he must suffer and die. There are important words there. He began to show them. Both Matthew and Mark say he began to show them. Both of these Gospels are being written years later. So this is the, the writers of the Gospel saying Jesus began to show us these things. And now Peter's bringing up an objection. It, in other words, he didn't spell everything out, and obviously the disciples didn't understand entirely what he did spell out. See, he, Jesus hadn't necessarily been able to explain everything to them at this point. So this comment in the Gospels is, at this point he explained everything, they're saying at, he, this is when he began to show us all these things that we now understand. See, this is why Peter didn't link the role of the Messiah with the death that Jesus was now talking about. When Jesus broached the subject of going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, Peter may have assumed that this was an invitation to express his belief in the quick victory and advance of the kingdom. Peter may have been thinking that Jesus was just saying, they want, they want to punish me and see me dead. And Peter said, no, we're, this isn't going to happen. Peter may have saying, I'm going to express my faith in the victory of the kingdom by telling Jesus this is not how it, it's going to be. Now, Peter had just recently seen the attacks of the scribes and Pharisees in calling Jesus demonic. He had just seen large numbers of those who had followed Jesus through the Sermon on the Mount and, and different places in Galilee, now offended when Jesus compared himself personally to God's manna from heaven. Peter had seen uh, the fact that it, John was now dead and... They had heard that Herod wanted to see Jesus. Peter knew that Jesus was now avoiding Galilee. So things didn't appear to be going real well in, in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus had gotten some, found some real opposition, and now he had political opposition in the person of Herod, and Jesus was now going to areas other than Galilee. Now Peter hears of Jesus going to Jerusalem and dying. Peter believes in the messianic role of Jesus and his kingdom, but he's likely assuming that both involve a political acceptance uh, of his kingdom and a, the, a visible victory of that kingdom. When Peter said, no, you don't have to die, that's not going to happen. Peter thought he was expressing his faith and his confidence in the kingdom of heaven because he assumed there had to be a manifestation and you couldn't have a kingdom with a, a dead king. So, he said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. He, he, he was telling Jesus, No, this doesn't have to happen that way. We're not going to let that happen to you is what he's saying. It, it won't come to that. Your kingdom is, in, is going to be victorious. Peter did not understand enough to see that the death of Christ was really the necessary means of victory. They hadn't, he, they hadn't connected the atonement and the death it represented with Jesus being the atonement. That's the way he was going to be the Messiah. They hadn't figured it out. They were thinking king, kingdom, David, victory, importance, throw off the Romans, certainly, and Jesus is healing people far and wide. This is going to be 
what we think of as like the millennium. It's just going to be good times are here because the Messiah is here. The whole idea of death didn't, of the Messiah didn't fit into that. So Matthew and Mark say Jesus began. When they wrote these Gospels, they could see that he was begin, then beginning to teach them what they then understood. And so that's what we have in verse 21. They're saying this is when he began to explain this to us. <clears throat> Jesus often spoke figuratively. And Peter may have been thinking that in talking about suffering and dying, he was speaking figuratively in some way. In fact, only days before, remember, Jesus had spoke of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, and they had taken that literally, and, and Jesus had scolded them, them for taking that literally. I'm not talking about real bread and leaven. I'm talking about the false teaching. So here they had taken him literally, and Jesus had corrected them. Just days before, Peter may have thought that this reference to dying was a figurative expression of some sort. So Matthew and Mark, in writing their Gospels, saw all that he spoke of throughout his ministry as they clearly understood it then and they described it in verse 21. But at, at this point, when Peter spoke this, he, he obviously didn't get it uh, and where the death of Jesus fit into his kingdom. Peter, at this point, only saw a picture of defeat in Jesus' words. So he speaks to Jesus and says, no, that's not going to happen. We believe it in you, and, and we believe in your kingdom. But in effect, he was telling Jesus how history had to unfold. We believe in your kingdom, Jesus, so this is what it has to look like. And we do the same thing. We look at the world and says the kingdom of God isn't going so well. Things are a mess. The forces of evil are in control. We still have this being said in the church. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus had spoken those words before. He had spoken them at the temptation when he dismissed Satan with those words. Satan had approached Jesus and asked him to respond in terms of his human need. He was hungry. Make yourself food. You want success without any effort? Let's just come to an agreement. I'll give you victory. Now Peter is telling Jesus to think of the future as, as he does. He's telling Jesus, this is what the kingdom, how the kingdom has to play out, and your suffering and death is not going to be a part of that. See, Peter was savoring. He was thinking in terms of the things of men. In his human understanding, he said, that doesn't make sense. And he was correcting Jesus and saying, that's not how things should play out. I have a better idea. Peter's telling Jesus, think, about, think of your kingdom as I do, Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus calls him out for this. He says, when you are savoring, you are thinking in terms of the things of men, not the things of God. Moments before, Peter had confessed who Jesus was and what had that Jesus said. He said, you're blessed because God has shown you that. That's God's thought that he has given you. God has revealed to you that I am the Messiah. And you are in a state of blessedness because God has revealed that. See, Peter was thinking that thought, that confession of faith, in, in terms of the things of God. He was savoring that confession in terms of the things of God. Now Peter's thinking like a man. This is not how we want our kingdom to develop. No suffering, no dying, we want victory. He cannot see the death of Jesus as a good thing. Peter suggested there had to be a better way. He was doing exactly what, Pete, what's what Satan had done in the temptation. Let's just do this another way, Jesus. Let's not do it God's way. Let's just do it another way. Peter had just confessed that Jesus was God, but now he was offering another way 
to Jesus. He seems to have completely missed the part about being raised from the dead. Or perhaps that was the, the fuller part that the disciples then injected, that he had begun to teach us these things, but, but not all of it yet. Peter said, or excuse me, Jesus said he must go to Jerusalem. And that must really applies to all those things. He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. He must be killed. He must be raised at the third day. He was speaking of the certainty of the Father's providence. Peter later understood this and himself preached it in Acts chapter 2, where he said of Jesus, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Then Peter got it. But at this point, he said, no, that's not how that we want the kingdom to develop. We want instant victory and acceptance and the expansion of the kingdom, and we want it, we want to see it now. Jesus then spoke to all the disciples, including Peter. Mark says that there were others present as well. And Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We tend to always assume that Jesus is saying that if you really want to follow me, you have to um, give things up for Jesus. That is, this is talking about self-denial and suffering for Jesus. Self-denial is sometimes necessary in the Christian life. But self-denial is uh, neither good nor bad if we decide that that's what we have to do for Jesus. A lot of ascetics in the early church believed that they were more spiritual by denying themselves. And so they literally punished themselves. They, they literally mutilated themselves because they say, I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm denying myself the comforts of life. And they, some of them lived very miserable lives. When, when I was, what grade do children go uh, to uh, uh, study the missions is a third or fourth grade. Mm -hmm. I was I went to uh, Mission Carmel with this uh, school field trip, and one of the most the things that I've always remembered about that field trip is Father Junipero Serra, who founded many of the missions. His bed was there. It was wood, heavy wood planks with wooden legs, and molded uh, carved into the, these wood planks was a wooden pillow. Now, how uncomfortable was that? But it was the ascetic monastic idea that I will suffer for God. Uh, <clears throat> he, you see, many ascetics believed that they had to force themselves to suffer for God and they would be more spiritual. But in reality, the cross, your cross is what God has for you. And some people have to deny themselves in a very uncomfortable way. Some people have to deny themselves, but God actually gives them a very good life. See, in other words, suffering is not necessarily an indication that you're serving God better than somebody who's not suffering. When he says, deny yourself, he would say, Peter, don't, he, he, it, it refers back to that savoring in the things of God, thinking in terms of the things of God or thinking in terms of the things of man. Think in terms of the things of God and follow me. You see, you do what I have for you, not what you want. Peter, you want this in the kingdom? You want to plan the kingdom? You just do things the way God has them and follow me. So taking up your cross is doing what God would have you to do, which may be difficult and it may be actually very pleasant. It depends what God has in store for you. Johannes Kepler, the... Uh, astronomer from a few hundred years ago spoke of thinking God's thoughts after him. That is, thinking God's thoughts after God. In other words, trying to understand things as God created them. And as he studied the stars, he tried to understand, in terms of scripture, how God created the universe and how the heavens operated. 
Peter was not thinking God's thoughts after him. He was assuming that God's kingdom had to work in a certain way and that he would correct Jesus if he thought Jesus was wrong about how it would play out. Peter didn't deny himself. He was thinking thoughts after the things of men. Peter injected himself and his own opinions into things. His wisdom was being injected into his discipleship. So to deny oneself is to savor the things of God, to think God's thoughts after him, to yield to God's way because it is God's way. And then the disciples said, take up your cross. Again, a lot of people assume that means it has to be painful like Christ's cross was. For some, that cross is going to be painful. For some, the cross that they bear is full of joy and gladness. It's not saying you have to suffer to be a good Christian. It's saying you have to do what God wants you to do. You have to follow me. And you have to do what God wants you to do. It's saying yield to God's will, then follow it. Christ knew God's will was for him to suffer and die on the cross. And he would have no opposing suggestions. As a disciple, we follow God's will. Verse 24 ends with, follow me. Verse 25 says, self-will only leads to self-destruction. Whosoever saves his life will lose it. Whosoever loses his life will find it and will know salvation. He will find true life in following Jesus. Peter wanted to save Jesus' life, so Jesus put him down in no uncertain terms. But Jesus then turned the idea back on each of his disciples. If you're not willing to give up everything and do things God's way, and stop injecting yourself and your own plans into, the, into God's plan, then you're going to fail, and you'll never find the kingdom. If you, you've got to stop injecting yourself and planning God's kingdom for him. You've got to follow me. But he said if you surrender and become God's men, if you think God slots after him, and take your duties as a soldier of the cross seriously, you're going to find life. That is, life in the kingdom. Verse 26, he is in effect saying, take your pick. One or the other. God's going to recompense you one way or the other. Verse 28, Jesus says, some of you present will not be alive. Will excuse me. Some of you present will be alive when the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. Peter's assumption was that the death of Jesus would be the end of the kingdom. So Jesus is saying just the, the opposite. He said, don't stop me when I'm talking about dying. But some of you are still going to be alive when I come in my kingdom. See? Despite the talk of suffering and death, the kingdom was going to be imminent. They were not mutually exclusive, as Peter would have assumed, as any of them would have assumed. Cross and resurrection were the victory of Jesus Christ over more than a piece of geography. See, the world is God's by right. He doesn't need to win it. See, the, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus represent a victory over sin and death, and that's what was man's fundamental problem. Jesus was thinking of a kingdom over more than a piece of geography, which was already belonged to him. He created it. So to think that we have to start with this little piece of geography here in the Middle East or elsewhere, and we have to claim that to have a victory is nonsense. It it's all belongs to God. So the victory has been won. So Christ's words are more pertinent than ever. He said, deny your will. <clears throat> deny your human wisdom and follow me. Savor the things of God. Think in terms of the things of God. It's in effect saying 
Make your worldview in terms of the things of God, not the things of men. Understand everything in terms of the word of God. That's your, your paradigm is controlled by the word of God. And a lot of Christians have a very humanistic worldview, and they try to fit bits and pieces of scripture here and there into a humanistic worldview. Not only have worldview intellectually, how we understand, but how you understand the world determines how you act. See, and Jesus said, I want you to act. I want you to follow me. I want you to take up your cross. You are going to follow me. You have duties. But it's not to stop me from dying. You know, and today that sounds ludicrous that Peter would tell him not to do what, what was absolutely necessary to his kingdom. But that's what happens when we inject ourselves into the planning of God's kingdom and we say this has to happen for the kingdom to advance. See, we think and act in terms of the we, reality that God reveals to us. We take up our cross. And that may be pleasant and it may be pain, or it may be painful, but we accept that as our responsibility. <clears throat> Too often we are told taking up our cross as our sacrifice for serving Jesus. Really what Jesus is saying here, it's a small sacrifice if you want to save your life. I'm telling you to do something and it's either lose your life or gain it. So is that a hard choice? Jesus isn't saying that's a terribly hard choice that you have to give up so much for Jesus. Jesus is saying it's really nothing. But you make the decision. Jesus says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You follow me, or you follow the, the ways of men. You savor things after the things of men, and you go your own way. Savoring the things of God, thinking in terms of the things of God, comes hard to us as fallen men and women. We look around and we see things, and our reaction is sometimes there's no way that this is how you advance a kingdom. And yet if you look at history, look at where the kingdom of heaven is now. And we can still look at the kingdom of heaven, we can still look at the, the church and say there's lots of problems in the church. It's far from perfect. You know, but where are the religions of the Romans? You know, the, their temples are just historical sites now. Nobody worships their gods anymore. The Roman Empire, the disciples all thought of a, of a kingdom as opposed to the Roman kingdom we would like to get rid of, but who cares about the Roman Empire? You know, it's, it's on the dust pile of history. I mean, it's, it's insignificant to us today. And so if you look at the things around you and say, this is a problem for the kingdom, you're looking at things that aren't really a problem. And if you look at the overall growth of the kingdom, Religions and empires have come and gone several times over, and yet what perseveres and what continues to grow is the kingdom of God. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Just stop thinking that you have to plan out the kingdom and accept your kingdom responsibilities. Follow me. That's your cross. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd give us an understanding of, of our responsibilities in your kingdom. Help us to have this worldview that, that is whereby we, we think in terms of uh, uh, your will, not ours. Th help us to think in terms of this advance, certain advance of your kingdom in time and eternity. Help us to think of the, the, the certainty of your victory. Help us to think in terms of the, the things of men as being absurd and temporary so that they don't consume our attention and our concern. Help us to focus on our individual responsibilities wherever those responsibilities yes. happen to, to lie. We pray that you would encourage us in your service. By the power of your spirit, teach us ever more and more to be faithful to your kingdom and our kingdom responsibilities. Teach us what our responsibilities are and help give us the, the, the strength to, to uh, move in terms of our individual responsibilities.
so that we do are taking up our cross. We are following you in whatever capacity you would have us. And we ask for your blessing upon each of us this week and your strengthening of us in your service so that we might give all the praise and glory to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is 462. Hymn 462, Living for Jesus. 462.